Um, so my goal for today's class is to resume this problem we looked at last time. And there's some subtleties here that I'd like to address. So if we look at the problem, I'd asked you to look at this investment. It's a, it's a turnkey piece of equipment that, this, that the company is going to install. It's going to save them $20,000 a year. And what we did in the previous class was we did all the calculations for the cash flows and the NPV. But we never really got to this part here at the end where we compared payback time, NPV, and DCFRR. So I'm going to quickly wrap that concept up. You may have the calculations that you have uh, on the piece of paper from last time, but it doesn't matter if you don't. What I'm going to look at more is the interpretation of those numbers. So we went through this on the board by hand, and here is the spreadsheet version of it. The spreadsheet is also posted on the course website. And the numbers that I'm really focusing on here are in fact column H. That was the, the net cash flow at the end of the period. Okay, so let's just, let's just really be understandful of, uh, let's understand really what's going on there. The net cash flow at the end of the period is essentially your bank balance. So minus 57,188 <coughs> means that you've, there's been a negative, a large negative outflow of cash. You had to pay someone $75,000 for this unit. You had some money coming in. You've made $20,000 by buying this unit. You've paid taxes though, 2188 uh, 2, and you got to write off some depreciation. Now depreciation wasn't a cash flow. That was the distinction from last class. Depreciation is a number though that reduces your tax paid. So depreciation affects your cash flow, but the depreciation doesn't exist as a cash amount. It doesn't change hands. You cannot buy or sell a depreciation. Now, the net cash flow though at the end of the period, this matters to a company. That negative 57,000, they're in debt by that amount. The next period, however, their bank balance looks a little bit better. It's $16,000 has flowed in. Okay, so minus $57,000 was the net amount at the end of the period. The second period, $16,000 flowed in. There's no time value of money here, right? We haven't even considered the time value of money. We haven't discounted it at, at all. Simply it says that that next period, you're going to get 16,000 flowing into your bank account. So if the prior period was minus 57, then at the end of the second period, your bank balance is going to be negative 41. Okay, minus 57 plus 16,000, your bank balance is less negative. The next period though, your bank balance increases by an additional 14,000. So now your bank is less negative. Then you get 13,000, then 12,000. And after five years, actually this investment really hasn't paid off. You're still at negative 77. Okay? So within rounding error, let's just pretend that that's zero. Within rounding error of the numbers here, that's essentially zero. You have paid back this instrument. Okay, so the payback time in this example is five years. If you want to be a little bit picky, it's about 5.1 years, but it takes five years. Zero, there's one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and you've paid back. You've essentially reached zero. Okay. Now let's take time value of money into account. This column, nothing in the example we did last class in, and in, to calculate column H includes time value of money. Let's just simply take column H and apply our time value of money formula. At 8%, the first cash flow is still minus 57,000. The next cash flow of 16,000, however, after we deflate it, becomes 14,800. So we deflate it by 8%. The next cash flow, 14,000 gets deflated down to 12. That's a deflation of dividing by 1.08 squared. The next cash flow, 13,000, gets deflated to 10. That's divided by 1.08. 08 cubed, and then the next cash flow is 9,400. So in effect, let's, if we just use this last cash flow as an example, that last year that you're running this piece of equipment, you've, in your bank account, you'll see 12,890 flowing in, but in today's terms, that's the equivalent of having only 9,470 show up.
Okay. Then we, in the same way we calculate the cumulative cash flow, we can calculate the cumulative TVM cash flow. So that's the last column over there. Simply run a cumulative sum and then it shows that if we take time value of money into account, we've actually made a loss of 9,500 on this equipment. Okay. <coughs> so was this equipment worth buying? No, not from a time value of money point of view. Okay. From, if you ignored cash flow, you might say this equipment neither had a positive effect nor a negative effect. Okay. But from, a ca from taking time value of money into account, it had a negative effect. Okay. I would not invest in this. If I was your CEO, I would not choose to invest in this piece of equipment. Now, that spreadsheet's online, and uh, you can go take a look at it. I'll pull it up over here, and I'm going to talk about column H over there, and there's that cumulative TVM cash flow. So I'm just going to bump this over a little bit so we can see it there. Now, I want to just change the numbers a little bit. So let's assume that our revenue in the first period is going to be $40,000, and then that's perhaps the only change I'll make. Okay. And I've made that change so that I land up with a positive cash flow if we don't take time value of money into account. And we land up with a positive if we take time value of money into account. So either one, if you're ignoring time value of money, it says you've made 12,900 on this equipment. If you take time value of money into account, you've made 5,500. So is this a good investment now? Okay. So provided that cash flow there in the first period of 40,000 is accurate, this would have been a useful investment. DCFRR, on the prior example, so let's take that back to 20,000, okay, DCFRR is 0%. Okay. There's no possible way you can make the interest rate make NPV equal 0. NPV is already negative. Okay. So time time value of money interest rate I, even if I put time value of money interest rate I at zero, I'm still not going to make NPV a positive number. There's no possible way I can do that unless I had negative time value of money, right? but we don't have that. Right? So DCFRR can only be 0%. That's the only way, that only valid number for DCFRR, but let's go back to a larger revenue over there. DCFRR is now 14%, and I'll show you how I calculated that. Yeah. You said if you make the time value of money 0%, you will have a positive. Yep. Yeah. Positive Let's try it. So TVM of 0. Let's go back to the $20,000. It's negative 77. I can't, I can't possibly make that number positive. I, you can't. Time value of money discounts. It's, you've already made a loss in this equipment not taking time value of money into account. So you can't make it a, a profit by taking time value of money into account. Okay? So there's a minimum DCFRR of 0% there. So back at our 8% time value of money, we've made a loss of 9,000. I'm going to bump that up to 40,000. Now, you've seen in the prior assignment that to calculate DCFRR, you've, you've done it by hand, right? You've tried various <laughs> interest rates and, and you trial and error, you try and get that value to zero. How did I get that number calculated right away? Well, there is a formula built in into um, Excel or into Google Docs that you can go use. It's up over there, equals sign IRR. IRR function, you need to give it column J. IRR function, you don't give it a discounted values. IRR function, you give it the net cash flow values without taking time value of money into account. You also have to supply as the second input into the IRR function an initial guess. So just any positive number, and typically a good number to use is your time value of money percentage. So use your MARR, and then it will find the DCFRR for you. Okay, so I had that out actually up in a prior slide as some self-directed learning for you to go investigate, but there, there it is. Okay, so would you invest in this project now from an NPV perspective? Yes. Would you invest in it because DCFRR exceeds MARR? 14% is greater than 8%. 
The answer is also yes to that. Okay. Brandon. Yeah, that would be equivalent to that, yeah. But that's, I'm, we're not likely to experience that generally in North America. Okay. Let me confuse you a little bit more. Well, it's not going to confuse you. It's just going to make you think and, and really probe your understanding. Let's get Niall's question first. Yeah. You want, no, I, you, you don't, it can change. It would be nice if it were, but it, we typically use the I that's given to us by our company. We typically use I equal to M-A-R-R, -R, given to us by our company. Right? Yeah, so I was going to ask what is M-A-R-R. -R. Yeah, I is 8% in this example. Your finance department tells you what time value of money it is, and that's what you use. Yeah, uh, that was a mistake, so I changed it over. That's why it was in red. Yeah, so if you, in your notes you see 10%, they just update that, please. Yeah, yeah good catch. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so here's what I want you to think about, and this is a real example that will apply to you. What if you decide to lease this piece of equipment instead of buy it? What's going to change in this spreadsheet if you lease the equipment instead of purchase it? <coughs> What's going to happen to your cash flows? What's going to happen to your depreciation? What's going to happen to your taxes? Well, you'll, you'll pay a lot of different, like you'll pay every period like a smaller amount. Right? You're going to pay every period a small amount. Is it an eligible expense or a non-eligible expense? You're leasing an equipment, you're not buying it. Yeah. Think about what depreciation does. Why does the government allow you to depreciate? And what does depreciation encourage? Okay. Depreciation is an encouragement to buy stuff, invest in new capital equipment, but if you don't have to. The government never forces you to do anything, real, well, sometimes. But in this situation, they're not forcing you to purchase or to lease. You, you can choose that option. Now, if you lease, let's take a look at what might happen. So you can take that spreadsheet and just make some minor modifications. So there's the leasing option. When you lease, you have no book value. You don't own the equipment, so you don't need to keep track of a book value. You have no depreciation e either. But remember, depreciation reduced your taxes. So leasing isn't necessarily a good thing because you don't get that depreciation benefit. Okay. What leasing does, though, is let's say the lease is $18,000 a year. And I'm not going to increase it. I'm just going to keep it a flat $18,000. Now, obviously, your lease price should be lower than the revenue you make from it. Otherwise, why would you lease something that's costing you more than you're gaining from it? So your lease is $18,000. You're making $20,000. So you're making $2,000 of taxable income. The government taxes that at 25%. So your net cash flow every year, your net cash flow, not taking time value of money into account, is positive $1,500. Make 1,500 every single period. Okay? And there, your time value of money, your cumulative cash flow then, taking time value of money into account is now plus 6,000. So this might be a better option, $6,500 of profit, provided you can find someone to lease that $75,000 piece of equipment for, for, to you for 18,000 a year. Okay? So lease, per, lease decisions versus uh, purchase decisions are a classic example of where t time value of money is taken into account and used. You've got a choice between two alternatives. Either you lease or you buy. Okay? So there's a financial decision, and you can evaluate it purely on this basis with two simple spreadsheets. Yeah. But there's no salvage value between last when you, zero. Yeah, we assume that. By the end, it's, it's worth zero dollars. Yeah. 
With a lease, you never, you never salvage. You, re you return it back. Okay, so play around with that example. Um, and the, with that, I don't have the lease spreadsheet up on the website, but uh, I, I will, I'm happy to post it. But it's easy just to take this example. Take your book value away you don't, because you don't purchase it anymore. And now you only have eligible expenses. Okay, so that, that type of question, you can, you can do that in your own per life with your choice of whether you buy a car or you lease a car. Right, there's an easy one, and it's probably something that you'll come to sooner rather than later in your, in your life. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, is it fair to assume that you don't have to perform maintenance on a lease, like on an equipment you lease? Yes, it is fair to assume that there's no maintenance on a piece of equipment because uh, when, you, when you lease it, that's part of the lease contract, right? So same when you lease a, a house, you expect your landlord to keep it up into good shape. You don't pay for the plumbing and other problems that happen. You just say, you take care of it. Yeah, what I'm saying is that the answer of whether you lease a car or buy a car is never, I can't say it's always better to lease a car or buy a car. Depreciation doesn't play a role when you lease a car. Depreciation definitely plays a role when you buy a car. Yeah. Same with a piece of equipment in a company. Okay. You, no, okay, as an individual, you don't get to depreciate, but depreciation in reality because the car will depreciate, will affect this, the final value you, you make on the car. Yeah. If you're purchasing a, as a company, you may choose to purchase a car or lease a car. Right? So you can incorporate your own personal business, and then you can choose to lease a vehicle or buy a vehicle. Then you're back to the same. It's now instead of a distillation column or a piece of equipment, you're now doing it with a car. Yeah. OK, so you get, you'll get to use this sort of topic right away in your personal life. Okay, now I just uh, this is probably a good point to have a quick discussion about spreadsheets and their use in this course, right? Presenting something like this to you as this class is okay, but it's not acceptable to present this to your manager. If you gave this spreadsheet to me as if I was employing you, and maybe I was, didn't have a degree in chemical engineering or in economics, I'd be like, I don't know what's going on here, right? This does nothing for me as a, as a manager. And you'll find, even though your managers are trained as engineers, my manager was the first to admit, I have no idea what NPV is. So I don't want to see it. I want you to tell me what decision to make and interpret these numbers for me. Okay. So in this course, for the assignments, don't hand in spreadsheets. We're not going to grade them. The TAs and myself won't grade them. What we do want to see is calculations, as I said in class, for at least the first two periods. So like we've done on the boards with notes to show us that you understand what's going on. Now, I know that a number of you have handed in spreadsheets for this current assignment too, and we'll accept it just for this one, but in general, we won't. So going forward, uh, please do, do not submit spreadsheets. You're welcome to please include them in the appendix of your reports and so forth to show your work, but um, we're not going to grade a spreadsheet. Like I, we're not going to go to every cell and check the formula is correct, right? We, does that make sense? And the reason needs to be clear. Like I'm not doing it just to be an ass. I'm doing it because I want you to be able to develop the skill of explaining yourself to your boss or to your colleagues, right? You're not going to work with people in the future who have had 4N or other economics courses. You're going to work with a variety of people with a variety of backgrounds. And being able to clearly explain this is a good skill. Yeah. I, we're only interested in details on the first two periods, because that's where all the interesting stuff happens. Everything after that is copy-paste. Yeah. No, but you can say to your boss, look, I've calculated time value of money as 5,500 over this five-year period. 
that means we're making a profit in today's money on our investment of 5,500. This is a worthwhile investment. It exceeds our company's MARR. We should be investing in this project. Right, so you're interpreting the, the numbers to your manager. Yeah. They, they're relying on you. Your manager, like if I'm hiring you as an engineer, I'm hiring you for your skill of interpreting the results, not because you can calculate NPV. Right? I can ask my finance department to calculate the NPV. Give me a spreadsheet to do that. If I knew what NPV was. You're, you will find in your career that your managers are hiring you to use your head and be insightful and creative with your decision making. Okay. So you use this as a tool to make your decision, but it's not, this is not your decision. This is the background to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in that question I didn't. But in the future you'll see that coming in. And that's so I've shown you how to explain it in today's class. So going forward you, you should be explaining it. Okay, let's go back to the notes and um, we're going to head into a new section over here. Um, so this is slide ninety. Okay, so just a bit of, uh, just of showing where we're going in this course, slide 90 points out, that, points that out to you. What we've looked at so far is the concept of time value of money, and part two we've looked at things like DCFRR, payback times, and various measures of profitability. All of that NPV analysis you notice had cash flow. Cash flowing in, cash flowing out. Okay. How do we estimate those cash flows? Up to now, we've given you the numbers. The next piece of the course is all about how do you figure that out and why it is important to be able to estimate that yourself. We're going to show you techniques to do that. I'm, in today's class, going to start talking about the various types of costs we need to address. On Friday, I'm not here on campus, so Tyler will be teaching the class. Tyler will be talking about a variety of ongoing costs. So I'm going to focus on capital costs in today's class, and I'll pick that up next week again. Tyler will, on Friday, sort of have this intermediate section on estimating ongoing operating costs. Okay, so that, uh, that's an important lecture. Let's understand first why this is even useful. So Syncrude's a company in Alberta. They've, over um, a number of years, they've had a a major project that they've been attempting to get off the ground over the past decade. Uh, so there's a bit of ba background about the company. You can read more about them. Um, so in this project, it was a project to increase their production capacity by a significant num amount, 100,000 barrels per day. Their engineers estimated the project would be 3.6 billion. So this was back at, in 2002. So more than 10 years ago. Then things went on. There was, uh, they faced a correction, 4.6 billion, then 5.1 billion. It ended up at 8.4. Okay. This is not uncommon. Right? You've all heard the rule, if you want to estimate something, double it and add a third. Okay. Someone gives you a guess of how much something's going to cost, double it and add a third. There's pretty much that proven that for you, okay? So this is not good, right? You go to your investors and you say, well, we need $3.6 billion to add to this. It's a whole lot harder to go back and get more money, okay? And it's, it's, it's really not right. We'd like to be able to get at, at least reasonable estimates. Here's another example, Suncor. <laughs> Uh, this happened just last year, and it was kind of coincidental. It happened around the time I was teaching this section. Um, Suncor, they just canceled their Voyager Upgrader project because of soaring capital costs. This article in the Globe and Mail, uh, there's a hyperlink there for you to go read. Um, they had to write down a whole lot of costs for that. What that means is that they've started to develop this project. They estimated $11 billion. They start the engineering on it. They start 
getting stuff, buying things, getting, um, buying land and getting the project into place. But eventually when they decided to cancel the project, they wrote off $1.5 billion. Just like, that's money sunk into the ground with nothing to show for it. Okay, is that a big number? Right, what, how much, like, when people throw up billions, people's minds just sort of go blank and fuzzy and they don't really pay attention to it. Let's put it in context. What is Ontario's deficit? What does Ontario owe to bondholders and shareholders and external investors? 200 billion. How much does Ontario pay every year in interest on that loan or loans? 10, 12 billion. Okay, every year Ontario sends, just pays $12 billion to keep these loans active and in, in paying the interest on it. So this project is the equivalent of one year's worth of interest payments from an entire province in Canada, the largest province in Canada. Now, that's significant, right? That project estimate of 11.6. Now, they didn't spend that. They'd spent a significant amount before they decided to cancel it. They'd already <coughs> invested $3.5 billion. And then look at this line, the sentence. This, you should be able to understand what the CEO means now. You've got enough knowledge from the course to understand when the CEO says this decision is in line with our commitment to capital discipline and our state of plan to allocate capital with priority given to developing higher return growth projects. Okay, do you know, understand what that means now after this course, after this week's? There's other investments out there that they believe now are more profitable they're willing to forego the 3.5 billion they've already spent and invest in those other projects and get greater returns. Okay, so we obviously don't like, you certainly don't want to be the, the engineer in charge of that project and have that canceled on you because of, of whatever reasons this was canceled for. Let's see how we can estimate these costs. Okay, now, <clears throat> The temptation when we come to this topic, people often say is, well, I can phone up my supplier and ask them. Okay. Think of a lot, and that's true. If you're, if you're buying a single pump, absolutely, phone up the supplier. Right? But we're not going to just buy a pump. When you're dealing on, a, on an expansion project, you're, there's, there's pumps, there's multiple pieces of equipment, there's piping, there's all sorts that go into it. How are you going to estimate that cost? Um, why do you need to be able to estimate those costs? So I'm going to have you try this exercise to give you a feel for this. Find someone who's sitting next to you and one of you is going to be the bank and the other person is going to be the restaurant owner. You want to open a restaurant and you want to get money from the bank. So the bank, you would ask the questions you would expect a bank to ask and the restaurant owner, you need to provide answers. Okay, so I'll give you two, three minutes to go through that exercise. Okay, so let's, um, let's get an idea here. Banks, a anyone who was the bank, what was one of the questions you wanted to know? How much do you want? 
Yeah, is that what the bank is asking? <laughs> the bank will always give you whatever you like. But what what is the bank want to know? Well, there's several things the bank wants to know. Yeah. What's your credit history? Okay, nothing. I've never done this before. Don't have any credit history. What else is the bank wants to know? ROI. How long to return the money? Anything else? Current revenues, Current revenues, projected revenues. Okay. Restaurant owners, what are you going to answer when they ask what is your pro your projected revenue? Any restaurants? No restaurants. What information do you need? Well, if you're a restaurant, you have to know which type of restaurant you are, okay? Because that's going to affect your your capital, right? Indian restaurant, Korean restaurant, they have a lot of overheads in terms of stuff in in their restaurant. If you only need tables and chairs and a stove, that's a lot less than a Korean restaurant which has the embedded stoves in your table or some of the other types of restaurants. Okay, so there's more equipment in some restaurants over in another restaurant. Projected sales, have you done your market research to figure out how much money you're going to have coming in? Okay. What sort of equipment does a restaurant have? Just throw out names of types of equipments. Dishwasher, fridge, stove. Freezer, AC heating, plates, cutlery, tablecloths, chairs. Sorry, debit machines, TV. Okay, are you going to phone up the supplier for each one of those? Okay, if you had to estimate this on quick calculation on whether it's profitable, it's going to take you a long time to get all those answers back from, it, from a variety of suppliers. No different to a chemical plant. In a chemical plant, there's all sorts of other issues, though, associated with doing that, right? You're going to take a long time to get those quotes from your suppliers. We've seen that. But there's a, a variety of other reasons why this is not a great idea to be phoning people up. One is when you get a quote from a supplier, you need to be able to judge whether they're giving you a fair value. Right? Is the quote for that distillation column a reasonable number? If they say it's 10 million, are they out to lunch or is that really a good deal? Okay. So you need to have some way of judging their quote. Confidentiality. Now, I will tell you this in all honesty. And it sounds a bit flippant, but it's true. A non-disclosure agreement is not worth anything. Okay? People talk. So NDAs or not NDAs, you can get anyone to sign an NDA. It doesn't mean that your stuff will be kept confidential. If you're going to a potential supplier and asking for a price on a distillation column, at the next trade show, you can be pretty sure that that supplier is saying, hey, I heard Syncrude is looking for a new distillation column. And the word will get around through the industry. Okay, so if you're trying to develop something and you've identified a market opening for a particular product, the last thing you want is a competitor to be at the, in the market before you get there. So if you're going around phoning up suppliers asking for equipment, your suppliers are going to figure out what's going on and they talk amongst each other. Okay. There is a, there's an ethical aspect there. If you're getting your supplier to do the work for you, that's really not an ethical um, behavior. And there's a whole lot more involved than just phoning up suppliers. Okay? I'm going to have you think about that um, in a second. So let's take a look. If you're deciding to open a restaurant, one of the first decisions, as I said, is what type of restaurant, how, what the basic elements are that you're going to need. That's it. No difference to a, a block flow diagram. If you're deciding you want to make benzene from toluene and hydrogen, you know that you're going to need a reactor, a separator, and another separator. Okay. If you're opening a restaurant, you know you're going to need <coughs> cooking material, stoves, cutlery, the basics. Right? But 
if that was as simple as it was, every restaurant would be identical. And we know that that's not the case, right? There's a whole lot more than just the basics. Well, we go to a more complex diagram. And this is where your course project is going to begin. I'm going to talk about the course projects next week. Essentially, you're going to start from this point where you've taken that same flow sheet now and there's not just a reactor, there's your reactor, but you first have to heat up your stream. There's a fired heater and heat exchangers and storage vessels. Okay. There's loops, there's recycles. There's a lot more here on this distillation column than there was in the prior diagram. You can take that even further still. And you, by the end of your course project, you're going to develop one of these where there's control loops and interlocks and safety features and multiple vessels for flexibility. Okay. So estimating this capital cost is where we're aiming for. Okay. There's even more detail that could be, could be gone to. We're not going to go into this. You will see this detail more in uh, the 4W course that follows on next term, next year. So we're going to look at some very quick ways of judging the costs. Order of magnitude, that is really just to screen investment. So when we're saying an order of magnitude, we know that there's huge error. We could be out by a substantial amount, but essentially this is simply choosing between alternatives. Do you go with a one type of flow sheet that's got a reactor and two separators, or do you go with a newer technology that's just emerging, that's supplied by a particular company, a third party? choosing between an entire technology. You could see this in practice as maybe you're going to use a technology that's from BASF, or maybe it's a technology from BASF's competitor. Right, so screening between those two alternatives, which type of flow sheet are you going to go with? Once you've made that decision, you start looking at the major pieces of equipment and adding those in. And then when we want to get to a definitive estimate, we really want a, cl a closer accuracy to the final value. And we've got a very detailed drawing there for that. Okay. Now, this takes time and money. It, it's not uncommon that these planning, just estimating the costs and planning the flow sheet is a substantial dollar figure. The nice thing is you get to write that off as part of the capital cost. Okay, so the, remember we said in an earlier class, design features in the capital cost, and you get to write that off and depreciate it. Um, the other thing, you may be, be sitting there throwing up your hands and say, why should I do this? I can have Aspen do this for me, right? You just connect all the blocks in Aspen and you're done. And you hit the button and it does the capital cost estimator, right? So why are we spending this discussion over the next few classes looking at this? Well. To get to the point where Aspen is, is a significant amount of work that's often iterative, right? So we don't get to this flow sheet from this flow sheet in, in a very short go. There's a lot of iteration that takes place and decision making that happens in between there. So that cost is significant. The other thing is, how does Aspen do it, right? Should we just use this tool and accept its value, right? What's going on inside Aspen? to calculate those capital cost estimates. Right? And in fact, they're based on the correlations and the tools we're going to be using in this course over the next few classes. So essentially, by learning what Aspen's doing, you're learning how it's working. And that's also good to know when um, there's shortcomings. Aspen cannot estimate capital costs for everything out there. So let's, let's learn at least how this is done, basically. So here's the flow sheet when uh, this is in uh, Dr. Woods's handwriting. Um, We've inherited a lot of course material in 4N from Dr. Woods, who taught this for a number of years. And this is one of the illustrations in his book, where in the feasibility stage, we're looking at alternatives, so technical alternatives. And there, the cost estimates are very, very broad. You could be out by as much as 100%. If you're still interested in the technology and have selected one, you can now go to that selection stage and start doing some detailed design. Then we'll talk about what FOB means and adding those costs. And then if you're still interested, you can now go to a proposal stage. This is where you've got enough information and you can go out to companies like Hatch, to a variety of, of contractors and say, 
give me a, a more definitive cost or work with me to get this. But you're not misleading Hatch. You're not saying to them, um, I want you to do my work for me and I'm going to use the capital cost estimate. You, you're committing to this. Right? And in fact, you'll find in practice when you go to a third party contractor like this, you're signing guaranteed documents that you're going to work with them. They're not going to do this estimate for you for free. Right? Once you have those costs in hand, then you go to the banks and investors and get your money. And that's where MARR kicks in. Okay, so we need to be able to go and get those costs um, together so that we can estimate what it's going to cost us to build this thing. Now, there's a lot more in here than you can possibly see from back there. Um, Tyler's going to go through some of those in Friday's class. But here's the, the, what I mainly want you to get is this, this diagram works the opposite way around. It works from right to left. At this stage, it's showing you your error. There's error of zero. At this early phase, you've got errors that are very, very large. And as you get to more and more detailed phases of the project, that funnel comes in and your error estimates are much smaller. OK, so Tyler's going to be talking about the stuff here on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side tomorrow, on Friday. What I want to do is have you think about some things here. This is really critical because you're going to start to think come to a realization how expensive it is to build stuff. So here's a diagram of an autoclave that's being delivered. So it's on a flatbed truck and it's being delivered to a company. When I buy that autoclave, I'm paying for the fabrication cost of it and the delivery cost. So that's called my cost as delivered. But I can't make a chemical plant from a tank sitting in isolation. That tank ends up as part of a flow sheet. And here's a, a diagram that shows us what fixed capital cost is. So I want you to get these two terms. This is what this exercise is about. Delivery cost is the cost of the unit plus the delivery. And that's going to blow up to a much, much bigger dollar figure once it's finally operating and installed. So let's um, just take a look at this photo. Get a bit light there. So we've got here a plant where there's a variety of flotation cells. There's about 50 flotation cells here in this figure. What additional things need to be paid for to get it from the prior diagram where you've got a, a single vessel on a truck being delivered to your site, what additional things do you have to pay for to get it to this state? Okay, so I'll give you a minute to, to write down any items. You should be able to create a list of at least 10 things that need to be paid for. Okay, let's hear some. Just shout them out. What else do you see in the drawing over there, in the, in the photo? Ladders, rails, scaffolding.
Testing. Sorry, what was that? Foundation. Ventilation. Safety. Lights, Lights yeah. Anything else? There's a lot of yellow in there. Paint. Brandon? OK, so the accessibility and the walkways. I think we had it. Ladders, rails, let's include it in there. Accessibility and walkways. Maintenance equipment. Contractors labor, let's just lump, lump it in there. There's fire protection, safety features, the building over it, the heating, cooling, valves, valves and piping. So this may be added there. Yeah, instruments, sensors, PLCs, programmable logic controllers. So all the stuff you learned about in 3P to get process control going in there. Right? What's anything to get this up and running from the delivery point to where this is actually making useful product? Process raw materials. Um, we uh, to get it up and running. So you definitely need raw materials when you're testing it. If you look at that vessel, those vessels. Just to get it tested and the engineering, there's a significant amount of raw materials to get that up and running. So raw materials for testing. Yeah, so you need a whole lot of jacks and rental equipment and scaffolding to get that stuff installed. So the installation costs, the labor of it. There's land and buildings, but there's also initially, you'll likely have to level the land, so some landscaping costs, building the foundation properly for it. There will be some initial permits to do that from the city or the local government. Okay. Patents that you're covering, yeah. Okay, so. A rough guess, if a piece of equipment costs a million dollars delivered, how much is it going to cost after you've taken all of that into account? Four to five million. Yeah. Okay, so we'll look at some of that in next class, uh, or sorry, on Monday's class, and Tyler will look at something else. In